Each year, ACS awards the David Carliner Public Interest Award to a rising star in civil rights, civil liberties, human rights, or immigrant rights. The judges who this year comprise Nan Aaron, Deborah Carliner, Judge William Fletcher, Linda Greenhouse, and Sarah Remus look for determined, creative, and effective advocacy, whether in the courtroom, with legislators, or in the street. This year, the judges named as Carliner Award finalist Atia Holly, the Deputy Director of the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta, who unfortunately was supposed to be here, but uh, her plane got caught up in the rainstorm and she uh, wasn't able to, I think she wasn't able to board and wasn't able to make it. Uh, for the past 12 years, Atia has worked to dismantle the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow in the so-called criminal justice system through impact litigation, most notably working to ensure that child defendants in Georgia can exercise their constitutionally mandated right to counsel. And I am pleased tonight to, to present the David Carliner Public Interest Award to Shira Wachschlag, the Senior Director for Legal Advocacy, General Counsel, and sole practicing attorney at the Ark of the United States. The Ark is the country's largest national organization that works to advance the interests of people with intellectual disability, autism, and other developmental disabilities. The Ark has long been a powerful activist organization. organization. Since 2014, Shira has been placing it at the forefront of the legal fight to end the segregation and exclusion of people with disabilities. One of the Shira's first victories, this is actually before she was at the Ark, was when she sued Netflix on behalf of the National Association for the Deaf, winning a consent decree in which Netflix agreed to caption all of its content. This, This was a victory in two regards. First, it ended the exclusion of deaf people from a major element of mainstream popular culture. That perhaps would have been enough. But even more important, it set a precedent that the ADA applies to the internet. That companies, just because they happen to be on the web rather than in bricks and mortar, that companies cannot legally exclude people with disabilities from the commerce, the society, and the culture that takes place online. I could talk about others of Shira's victories in voting rights, in education rights, uh, in prisoners' rights, to tell you about how she works within the disability rights movement uh, and the broader civil rights bar to integrate the two, and how she brings an intersectional civil rights analysis to disability and brings a disability analysis to civil rights law. She emphasizes how, especially in schools and in prisons, discrimination on the basis of disability often overlaps and heightens discrimination on the basis of race and gender and vice versa. She is a civil rights disability lawyer and she insists that these two things cannot be separate. But because we are still in the midst of a global pandemic, I want to tell you about Shira's work over the last two years during COVID. You may remember, we heard uh, Russ Feingold give us a very long list of the things that had happened over the last two years. So you're excused for not remembering this, but you may remember that in the worst days of overflowing hospitals and ventilator shortages, there was a sudden rise of people proposing and attempting to implement more or less explicitly eugenicist rationing policies. These people imagined that disabled people's lives were worth less and therefore hospitals should exclude them from life-saving care. Shira led a nationwide fight against this medical discrimination, including filing 14 complaints with the Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, challenging policies that denied disabled people equal access to treatment. She and her partners also fought against no visitor policies uh, that denied accommodations to disabled patients and against inaccessible testing. She fought in the federal regulatory agency, in courtrooms, and in the national conversation through research and policy documents. And as, as a result, she won from HHS a bulletin that prohibited discrimination against disabled people and eight favorable resolutions with states and hospitals. 
and we know that the fight is not over. Shira also successfully challenged state policies that prohibit local school districts from imposing mask mandates, a prohibition that would deny equal access to education to students at higher risk of severe illness, and thus which creates the segregation of students with disabilities. She continues to fight to ensure that our social recovery from COVID does not leave behind those who are most vulnerable to it. There seems then no better time to honor Shira Washklog with a David Carliner Public Interest Award. Please join me in congratulating her. Thank you so much to the American Constitution Society and the Carliner family for this tremendous honor. It is incredibly humbling to receive this award in a room full of so many civil rights warriors, many of whom I am privileged to call my colleagues and friends. It is not possible to talk about civil rights without referencing the symbolic touchstone of the movement, Brown v. Board of Education. The disability rights movement has a similarly watershed but much lesser known Supreme Court decision. In 1999, in Olmstead v. LC, the Supreme Court held that unjustified isolation is discrimination based on disability. This statement was and remains revolutionary. The court recognized that unnecessary institutionalization severely diminishes the lives of people with disabilities and ruled that public entities must instead serve them in the most integrated setting appropriate. Though this decision is foundational in disability law, over 20 years later, it remains radical and is far from fully realized. There are many accomplishments to celebrate in the history of the disability rights movement that led to the laws and programs we rely on today. In the 1970s, the ARC and the disability community led the historic fights against institutionalization and fought for the right to an education for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The ARC and the disability community have fought to establish and maintain critical disability benefits programs and successfully fended off policies seeking to destroy and undermine these programs. Following years of relentless disability community advocacy, the Section 504 regulations were signed and the Americans with Disabilities Act was enacted to provide a clear and comprehensive mandate for the elimination of discrimination against people with disabilities and their integration in the economic and social mainstream of American life. These were all groundbreaking victories, but we are far from where we need to be. A life in the community with the supports necessary to thrive and live as independently as possible is critical for people with disabilities. But the current system is a patchwork of inadequate funding which requires most people to be impoverished to receive services and continues to have a bias towards institutional settings, resulting in decades-long waiting lists of over 800,000 people. A well-trained and fairly compensated direct support professional workforce is essential to providing community-based services. But because of underfunding, there is a national DSP crisis with a 45% turnover rate and an average wage of $10 per hour. A quality education is a linchpin to a successful life, but students with disabilities continue to face barriers in obtaining a quality education, including barriers to accessing needed supports, segregated classrooms, and harsh discipline. This results in many students with disabilities leaving school stigmatized and at risk of entering the school to prison pipeline. People with disabilities have the right to justice and fair treatment in the criminal legal system, but too often they are subject to abuse and exploitation, fail to receive accommodations, and are denied community-based alternatives to incarceration. Our healthcare system too often devalues the lives of people with disabilities. This was all too evident during the pandemic when people with disabilities faced discrimination in accessing life-saving treatment, facing harmful stereotypes and assumptions regarding their worth and quality of life. Competitive integrated employment is a key part of living a meaningful life 
and inclusive life in the community. But people with disabilities continue to face unequal pay and staggering unemployment rates, resulting from the myriad of barriers in obtaining jobs, including bias, low expectations, and failure to provide needed accommodations. Accessing the fundamental right to vote is critical to ensuring people with disabilities can make their voices heard and bring about a more accessible world. But people with disabilities have historically been disenfranchised from voting due to access barriers and restrictive capacity laws. In all of these areas, people of color with disabilities are often disproportionately harmed, leading to compounded discrimination and stigma. We must address these intersections and ensure there are meaningful partnerships between groups fighting for disability, economic, and racial justice. Every day, the ARC and the broader disability community fight to ensure that principles of integration and inclusion are meaningfully implemented in every aspect of the lives of people with disabilities. It is critical that disability be considered in every aspect of civil and human rights work, and it is vital that people with disabilities themselves be included in these conversations. I look forward to partnering with the ACS community to continue the necessary work to shift the public consciousness to a more universal understanding and embracing of disability justice and the intersection of race, poverty, and disability. Please don't be shy about reaching out to discuss how you, may take, how you might take on these issues in your own work. We need each and every one of you in this fight. I have so many people to thank for teaching me how to be an advocate and getting me to this point. Thank you to the dedicated professors at Berkeley Law who trained me to be a lawyer and fostered an unparalleled public interest community. So many of my law school classmates remain in public interest law today, and I am lucky to call them valued colleagues and friends. Thank you to the Skadden Fellowship Foundation for enabling me to become a disability rights lawyer right out of law school and all the support I continue to receive from the foundation and the fellowship community. Thank you to my colleagues at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, many of whom are founders of the disability rights movement. In my first job out of law school, they showed me what being a fierce advocate for disability justice means and taught me how to think expansively about the application of federal disability rights laws to every new challenge that arises. Thank you to all of my co-counsel at other civil rights organizations and law firms around the country who helped make this work possible. Suing states and school districts is rarely glamorous and often draining, and there is no one I would rather be in the litigation trenches with than you. Thank you to my colleagues in the Disability Rights Bar Association who so generously share their expertise and make themselves available for whatever is needed to advance the cause. Thank you to my colleagues at the ARC, table 10, including, yes, let's hear it for the ARC. <laughs> including all of our national staff, led by our CEO, Peter Burns, chapters, board members, and legal advocacy committee, for your confidence and trust in me to do this work, and for everything you have taught me in my nearly eight years at the ARC about how to be an effective advocate. I am privileged to be able to work with and learn from such dedicated and passionate colleagues with such deep expertise in the field. Lastly, but most importantly, I want to thank my family. As the sister of, to two adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and the mom of a daughter with IDD, this work is deeply personal to me. From the day I was born, my family taught me what it means to be a fierce advocate for inclusion. It means that when the status quo is unacceptable, you fight it and don't give up until you've created a new one. You dream big, build new partnerships, never take no for an answer, and use every tool in your toolbox to create new realities. I could not do this work without the constant support and encouragement of my incredible husband, Eli, our extended families, and the amazing people who take care of our children while we work. Thank you again to the American Constitution Society and the Carliner family for this tremendous honor. I am excited to be part of the ACS community and partner to create a more inclusive and accessible world for people with disabilities in the face of ongoing existential threats to fundamental civil rights. 
Together, we must work to ensure that the principles of Olmsted are meaningfully implemented in new and innovative ways to ensure people with disabilities can lead the lives they want in the communities of their choice, free from discrimination. We have so much work to do, and I look forward to doing it with all of you. Thank you.